at least in comedy, that can be the enemy of pilot. How you doing? Now when somebody brings up in the room, everybody's like, shut the f up. That's what she said. <laughs> There's a scene in Seinfeld. I'm making me thirsty. We're basically budget Dark Knight. No, this is like one of the most fun interviews I feel like we've done. Sitcoms hold a special place in our culture, often weaving their catchphrases and quotes into our daily conversations. Yet very few actually stand the test of time. So what's the secret behind the success of great sitcoms and what separates it from the more forgettable shows? Instead of just telling you my opinion, I decided to enlist the help of the two showrunners of the acclaimed sitcom Abbott Elementary, Justin Halpern and Patrick Schumacher. Hello, how's it going? Have you ever gotten to the end of a TV show and thought, what in the world was that? It seems like the writer just took every possible idea they could think of and threw it all into one episode. And it ends up being a mess. This is why Halpern and Schumacher use a very specific technique when they start a new show or a new season to make sure that they're always on track. Yeah, I mean, before we do any show ever, we try to figure out what the North Star is. What's the show about? What is that thing that the show is about that when we get lost, when we're breaking stories, we can look back at this thing that's like, oh, this show is about this. So for Abbott, what our sort of North Star was, was a group of people trying to do their best when everything else is against them. It's just like, how do we maintain relationships and friendships all under the stress of we're trying to do our very best in a very broken system. We do that for every character too. What's Janine's emotional journey in this season? And so the first season is about identity, self-discovery. She wants to do good, but she doesn't know what that actually looks like. And so that's what we're going to show her over the course of the first year. That's who runs the world, kids. Characters are the driving force in every story. If every character in your favorite sitcom was exactly the same, I can guarantee it wouldn't be your favorite sitcom. So how do you create an ensemble of great, memorable characters that are different and that feel real? And it's sort of like a cliche thing that people say, but like everyone is the hero of their own story. And I think what that really means is there is some humanity to everyone and reasoning for the for why they behave the way that they behave. Who is this person and what do they want? And then what do they actually sort of need? And that want and the need are usually two different things. Janine wants to be respected by the older teachers and the best first grade teacher in the entire world. But what she needs to do is stop looking for that outward affirmation and do something that makes her feel good about herself as a teacher and a person. So those two things are so far apart, right? And then slowly over the course of an entire series, we bring them together. Sitcoms are different than a drama where every episode a character grows. Walter White is a science teacher who has answer for the pilot and he is a drug kingpin who will kill anyone to get what he wants in the finale sitcoms are different their changes need to be like microscopic we don't want ava to suddenly not be ava in the third season of the show instead what we want is for characters grow very very slowly but also we would rather reveal the humanity of characters as to the audience as we go along there's an episode in season one ava we meet ava's grandmother for the first time. And we see that she has to take care of her grandmother. Her grandma's got dementia. There's nobody else there to take care of her. And it doesn't mean that Ava is suddenly a good person. It means that she is saddled with this responsibility. It has presented challenges in her life. It is also why when she's not at home, she wants to fuck around and be a less serious person because when she comes home, she's dealing with very serious matters, right? And that's something we reveal to the audience. Ava has been this way for however many years Ava's been on the planet. It's not one episode is not going to change who she is. It's not realistic. We first, when we're building an ensemble, we want everyone to come from a different point of view. If you've written an amazing script, you can remove all of the character names and everyone will know exactly who's saying what, even without any of the character names, because it's that character is the only person that could say that. Typically, when somebody talks about antagonists and villains in film, they're going to bring up dramas and thrillers and most likely the Joker, right? But sitcoms have villains and antagonists too. This is what Justin's approach is to creating antagonists in sitcoms. 
I think one of the most fun things about villains, if you think about the people that you hate in your life, it's because they like a lot of times they tap on some insecurity that you have. I mean, that does that's not to say that they aren't assholes or insidious human beings, but they tap into this like insecurity that you have inside yourself that you don't want touched and it makes you hate them right and so if you look at like Ava Ava in the first season was quote unquote the antagonist of Abbott and Janine but the reality was like Ava someone who says what she wants when she wants to say it she is comfortable in her own skin and has a shitload of self confidence those are all things that Janine struggles with, right? So when they are thrown into her face in this aggressive way by this person who is not sort of playing by the same rules that Janine plays with, then she becomes Janine's antagonist. But really all she's doing is pointing out all the things about Janine that Janine doesn't really like about herself. I hate when I watch a movie or a television show and the villain is just this like two dimensional, like I'm gonna destroy the world. It's like, okay, sure, anybody can fucking think of that. The most interesting villains to me are the ones who sort of have a point. You may not like the way to go about it, and it may be the wrong way to go about it, but the thing that they're saying is making our main character, our protagonist, really, really uncomfortable. And I think that is when the most like interesting stories are told is when our protagonist is, in, is put into an incredibly uncomfortable situation that makes them have to like dig deep, deep find a way to overcome their own problems and that are being shown to the world because of the antagonist in order to succeed and solve the problem. Brought up like the, the Joker, like I would argue like that Heath Ledger's version of the Joker did sort of do that to Batman. That movie was sort of about Batman wrestling with his own like ethos because of what the Joker was doing. The Joker was making the whole city kind of wrestle with their own ethos. That's to me like the most interesting villain. And Christopher Nolan did that with two exploding boats, and we do that with a step class. We're basically budget Dark Knight. <laughs> do you like pie? Fruit should not be hot. Okay. okay. On the quest to find what makes a great sitcom, probably your first guess, and it was mine as well, was the comedy, right? The jokes, the, the witty one-liners. And you would be partially correct. However, Halpern and Schumacher really opened my mind about a common misconception that even I was guilty of when it comes to comedy and sitcoms and joke writing and where it actually comes from. For me, it, it always just starts with, you know, these philosophies, to go back to that word, of these, uh, of these individual characters. The sort of like asymmetrical, like juxtapositions of it. it sounds really mathematical and boring. And there's nothing inherently funny about educators these days and what they have to deal with. It's bullshit. But that combination of, of you know, these truth tellers confronting this broken system is where you can get, all you, all you can help but do is, is laugh at that sometimes. If you've drawn these characters well enough and everybody starts to get to know them and understand them and you get to that spot where you can remove the name and you still know whose line it's what that's when you get to that place where you can have that moment i mean peter talked about it as like there's a scene in seinfeld where this woman has got a bad haircut and jerry and elaine and george don't have the like fortitude to tell her this haircut is not flattering and then kramer walks in and everyone starts laughing Jerry has set it up so that Kramer will come in because they know Kramer will say the thing that nobody else will say because that's who that character is. So immediately he opens the door and the audience starts laughing. That was the example Peter gave. If you've done your job as a writer and a performer and we know who this person is, I know that if Ava decides she wants to teach Janine's step class with her, as an audience member, I'm like, this is going to be funny because these two people and this situation are so primed for comedy. And I think as writers, when you're, when you're writing on a show, you have to know, have I earned that spot? Yet? Have I earned it to the point where now I'm ready to do the Ava and Janine episode because everybody's going to know what that means once I do it. Can I just draw? Whatever it takes to keep you out of my hair. Sir, you are bald. One of the most important factors when it comes to a sitcom's longevity is actually at the very beginning with the pilot episode. Halpern and Schumacher have pitched and sold many, many pilots in their career. And so I wanted to know not only what makes a great sitcom, but what makes a great pilot. 
pilots are so challenging, right? Because when you write a pilot, you're introducing characters to people. And I think a lot of times in comedy pilots, people try to like win the day with the like punchlines in the comedy pilot. But a little bit, it's sort of like saying when, when you're just like pumping, pumping, pumping punchline after punchline and you can't get a sense of who the person is. It's a little bit like if I was going to introduce you, I was going to bring some friends to your house and I was like, oh, and you have to meet my friend Pat. He's the funniest fucking person you ever met, right? When he walks into your door, you're there's way too much expectation on it and there's no context for it. You don't know Pat. And part of what makes, I think, comedies work is that you get to know the characters and then you can last. You should keep your pilot story simple. If you're making a comedy. And I think that you want to have as much time possible to have them have interactions that don't have to push the story forward at such a quick rate. I mean, I certainly think every scene should push the story forward, but I think if you make it too plotty, then suddenly you're servicing a plot and you're not servicing character. And character is, I think, what really pushes things to a place where they can get picked up. The Abbott pilot's a great example of what Justin's talking about because it's about getting new rugs for the school. And like, on paper, that sounds really low stakes. Some executives that are, you know, having to give notes and like justify this show coming into existence with their bosses, they're gonna flag that as something like, hey, let's talk about the stakes of this. Like, it's not feeling like it's high enough. At the end, we didn't change a thing as far as the, the plot was concerned, but you know, we were able to explain a little bit the actual emotional significance of those rugs. They do have deeper meaning. And to these characters specifically, they really matter. And, and it's that specificity, I think, that, that helps, you know, sell a show as well. I think people can tend to get really bogged down in the, like, intricacies of a plot. And I think it's, at least in comedy, that can be the enemy of a uh, pilot. I mean, we used to be big on, on writing premise pilots, right? Where it's like, it sort of gives you the, the why now of, of the show. Like, why are you picking this particular storyline to start? The, it, it, it's like obvious why you've picked that, right? Or it's like, uh, you know, disgraced football coach goes to a uh, hometown to coach a uh, high school football team and rehabilitate ER after like scandal or whatever. Like it's 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 more of like a, a premise pilot, right? You're, you're sort of starting from scratch. Abbott was not a premise pilot. It, we just kind of dropped you in. Yes, like Janine was relatively new to the school, but she had already had a year under her belt. Like she already knew everybody. And I think moving forward, I'm more inclined to do pilots like that, where it could be kind of any episode to start the show, try and be as efficient as possible in delivering character, delivering a little bit of plot that's compelling but it's more about being efficient at introducing all of those characters very concise way and showing exactly what the promise of the premise of the show is in a really efficient way which is you know how these characters are going to ping off of each other you know i'm a feminist that's why i let you pay for all my stuff and yeah and i appreciate that every writer faces problems with their story but very rarely do you hear about that experience from professional screenwriters themselves so I was curious, was there a moment in the writer's room where they faced a major problem and how do they go about solving it or not solving it? So I'll tell you one that ended in failure. And this is a perfect example. This, this will teach you why character is most important and why it should drive story. We had this idea for spirit, a spirit week episode. We want Janine to just go overboard during spirit week. We were talking about it and we were like, okay, well, but, but we always start with like, what is the episode about, right? Like what's, what's the actual like theme that we're exploring in this episode? What, what are we learning about Jean's character? How are we testing her character? And we were like, oh, well just Jean goes overboard when she does anything. But there was no real theme there past that. There was nothing to mine. And so we kept running into these walls where you find yourself just being like, and then this happens, and then maybe this happens, you're drawing dead. You've lost a plot. Because it really needs to be like, this is an episode about this character and this specific thing to them that is driving the story. And you don't have to just come up with story beats that have no ties to the character at all. If you're just being like, well, what if this happened? It's like, well, you could say, what if this happened to anything and any character? But it's like, why is Janine making this happen? 
And we could never get there. We could never figure out like what the next step was for why Jean was doing it and what she would do. And so we talked with the writers and we got it to a place where we were like, yeah, maybe this story works. We showed it to these two executives at ABC that we trust a lot and we love and who have been champions from for the show from the start. And one of them said, I'm not sure I get what this episode is. And immediately we were like, that's because it's about fucking nothing and we can't figure it out. <laughs> and we threw it out. We threw out the episode. It's the only time we've ever, I think, thrown up out an episode that we did a story area for. So I think that's an example of when you reach failure in the room. But the only way you get there is by trying to mine the character and try to figure out, is is this shedding some new light on it? Is this breaking new ground for us? Is this interesting and funny to find these things out about these characters or learn or see these characters in these certain situations? And I think that only comes from like, you know, you have 11 writers in a room. They're all having a sort of passionate discussion about the characters. And I think that once you lose your way and you start talking about plot instead of talking about character, you end up with Spirit Week. No, this is like one of the most fun interviews I feel like we've done. I always feel like an asshole talking about process, but it is fun to actually like, you know, if I know it's for an audience that actually wants to hear that kind of stuff, it's it's. It's fun to talk about. We, I don't think we've done any other interview that's been like that. Thank you for taking us behind the curtain. Thank you so much to Patrick Schumacher and Justin Halpern for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like and subscribe. And this is what we do at Behind the Curtain. We learn about story from real writers themselves. My name is Nehemiah. This is Behind the Curtain, and we'll see you next time.